Moving on to our last presenter, uh, presenting on optimization of moxifloxacin dose during treatment with efavirenz in participants with multidrug resistant tuberculosis and HIV. We have Dr. Juan Eduardo Resendiz Galvan. He obtained his master in sciences in PhD in pharmacological sciences from the Autonomous University of San Luis Potosí, Mexico. His research focused on applying nonlinear effects modeling to describe the pharmacokinetics of immunosuppressive drugs such as tacrolimus and mycophenolic acid in kidney transplant patients. In February 2021, Eduardo joined the Division of Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa as a postdoctoral research fellow. Currently, he is working with the pharmacometrics of drugs used to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Um, Juan Eduardo was my my uh, was a fellow researcher at the same university I, I graduated in, and he was always an outstanding researcher, and he has won many awards in our little city due to his outstanding research. So welcome, Juan Eduardo. So thank you for the presentation and also the uh, to the organizers for this invitation, especially to Patty, uh, that was the one who reached me out for um, to 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 be part of this seminar. And thanks to all the speakers as well for the very nice presentations that we have seen during this morning for me. And uh, as you mentioned, I will present today this work that uh, we have been doing during the last year that is called optimizing moxifloxacin dose. Um, for patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis and uh, also people living with HIV, specifically for the treatment uh, with the fibrins. Uh, and I would like to mention that this uh, work was uh, published already this year in February in the AAC journal. And this is a full list of all the collaborators that we have uh, that we have for this um, for this project. So I would like to start with this information about moxifloxacin and, and tell you why moxifloxacin is important. And as you may know, mycobacterium tuberculosis is about uh, causing the tuberculosis. And the first line of treatment are the first line of treatment. It is composed by these drugs that we can see here in this table: isoniazid, rifampicin, paracinamide, and ethambutol. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis it has been developing or acquiring uh, resistance by different mechanisms that I'm not going through during this presentation. Uh, but we can see it here in this in this table as well. Most of the uh, two of the most important resistances that have been described already are the rifampicin resistant tuberculosis and isoniazid that together compound that well known uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis according to the WHO. The issue is that this multidrug resistant tuberculosis um, is still being an issue uh, worldwide, and South Africa is one of the seven countries uh, with the highest burden of uh, tuberculosis cases. And it has been reported in different areas here in South Africa that more than 50% of the cases with tuberculosis are also people living with HIV. That makes uh, a, a huge, um, this makes a, a huge uh, problem uh, that it should be uh, 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 something that we can solve eventually. Um, and while moxifloxacin, it is recommended actually by the WHO as part of the group A to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis, uh, as we can see here together with other, other three drugs. Um, so that is why the PODRTV study focused and, and developed different PK models, models for different drugs, including moxifloxacin. And right now you are seeing, you are seeing here the uh, protocol that was followed for moxifloxacin where after the recruitment of the participants, they were on treatment with moxifloxacin uh, with uh, 400 milligrams once daily. And the first PK visit that uh, we got for these participants was between this, the first and six weeks after treatment initiation. Uh, we collect intensive uh, sampling with this schedule at pre-dose up to 10 hours post-dose concentrations, uh, a total of six samples. This was the first PKB. So then the second PKB that we had, it was to evaluate the effect of uh, crushing tablets. Uh, in this second visit, it was around 24 days after treatment initiation. And a group of 24 or 26 participants uh, from the first PKB, they came back to the clinic and they uh, provide uh, more samples. In this case, uh, the dose given that day, it was a crushed tablet of moxifloxacin and the schedule uh, sampling was the same. These are the overall characteristics of the population that uh, we include for this study. Um, they were 131 participants, South African, all of them are adults, and most of them were male. 
And from these 131 participants, uh, 79 of them were HIV positive, and 29 of these HIV positive uh, uh, participants were on a Fabirens antiretroviral treatment based. And these are the characteristics, a very general characteristics uh, for the participants. So the once we collate all the data, we put together all this information and we use the, mod, the software NonMem to model, uh, to create a model. And in general, we got a two compartment model um, as my um, colleagues that speak before me, um, they show what is the process to develop a model. And in this case, I'm just putting here the final version and I will describe it uh, just very briefly. So after the moxacin, oral dose is given, we assume that the, the amount of this drug, it is distributed along transit compartments to complete the absorption. And then uh, before to move to the central compartment, there is a first pass effect of moxifloxacin, which means that the liver is extracting certain amount, amount before the uh, distribution to the systemic circulation of moxifloxacin. And then eventually the uh, amount, remaining amount, it is moving along a central compartment and also to a peripheral compartment that is described in this part. These are the values that we obtained for, um, for this model. It is important to mention that we use allometry scaling base of fat-free mass for all the disposition parameters for both compartments. And the, the way that we evaluate the uncertainty in this case, it was using sampling importance or sampling to uh, estimate the 95 uh, confidence interval for these, for these parameters. But the most important thing that we found in this case, it was that the Fabrians uh, co-administration together with moxifloxacin, it is increasing the intrinsic clearance of um, moxifloxacin. And I will describe it and I will continue with the result later. But um, at this point, I would like to mention that uh, we didn't see any effect of the um, on the PK parameters uh, related to the crushing tablets for moxifloxacin. Uh, and in this case, um, it was evaluated for all the other uh, uh, drugs that were given at the same time, but uh, this is another uh, publication from 2019. And also before to move in uh, further with this um, interaction between moxifloxacin and, and, and favorance, I would like to mention one of the challenges that we had when we were uh, publishing this model, because um, we use something that is called the well steer liver model to explain the hepatic extraction of moxifloxacin after the oral dose. And one of the comments from the reviewers was that, um, what about the other liver models that exist to uh, represent the hepatic extraction of drugs? Uh, one of the most common, it is uh, this one that we can see here on the right side, that is a parallel tube. And I'm not going to describe these models right now, but uh, in general, there are um, a few differences between these two. For example, the well steer liver model that we can see on the, on the left, it is assuming that the, the uh, uh, hepatic blood flow moving uh, uh, through the liver, it is constant and the, um, there is no assumption about the area uh, that is extracting drug in the liver compared to the parallel tube that is making assumptions about the uh, area that is um, extracting drug in the liver. And also that uh, it might be a difference uh, in the unbound fraction from oxyfloxacin that it can be extracted by the liver. So the thing is that we, in this case, we are using a more simplistic model and less mechanistic than a, a PVPK model, for example, where uh, the parallel tube, uh, it will be a better option than the well steel liver model. So I, I was just, I just wanted to highlight this part as well, that uh, this model is quite simplistic and, uh, but for purposes of PVPK modeling, it is uh, good enough. And in the end, the assumption that uh, a drug, it is being extracted by, by the liver, um, it is the same. And in the end, the, the mathematical equations related to the, the QH, which is the clearance, uh, intrinsic clearance, are the same. So why moxifloxacin is, is inter it is interacting with the fibrins? The thing is that moxifloxacin, it is metabolized by the UGT enzymes in the liver um, that produces two different metabolites that it will be eventually uh, extracted uh, renally. And Fabrians is an inducer of these USDT enzymes. Uh, that is why the interesting clearance of uh, moxifloxacin it is um, higher uh, with this uh, comedication. And we saw this effect in the area under the curve concentrations that we can see here uh, on, the, on this panel. In blue are those uh, AUCs 
from uh, the people with uh, effavirenz and on red, uh, pinkish color, those without effavirenz, where we can see that the uh, exposure it is much more higher than compared to those uh, participants with effavirenz. And we also saw this in, in a visual predictive check, and I just put it here as part of the evaluation after the SER or the sampling importer sampling that. Uh, as uh, one of the speakers also mentioned that it is a way to evaluate or uh, yeah to evaluate our model but we can see here that the overall exposure between these two groups it is it is quite different so in order to evaluate the probability of target attainment because there is a target attainment that we can um, aim to reach uh, for moxifloxacin which in this case is a fluoroquinolone so as a fluoroquinolone uh, the pkpd or the pharmacokinetic pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic index that is well accepted uh, in order to evaluate the efficacy is the uh, area under the free concentration curve divided by the minimum inhibitory concentration. That, uh, that is another uh, topic to discuss maybe in a different talk, but this uh, comes from in vitro um, data and the most accepted value for this PKPD index. It is uh, a value of uh, 53. Um, uh, the uh, scenarios that we uh, simulated for the probability of target attainment, and I'm sorry for this very um, low quality of the table, um, to, to simulate these different scenarios, we use two different uh, regimens that are proposed by the WHO, the standard uh, dose regimen and the high dose regimen. And I just want to mention from here that uh, we can see that for the standard dose by WHO, it is um, uh, they are recommending a dose of 400 milligrams uh, reg uh, regardless of the weight band where the patients are. It doesn't really matter if they are uh, lighter or heavier. Compared to the high dose regimen, that is, uh, the, the, it is proposed a dose up to 800 milligrams, but the first two weight bands, it means uh, up to four, uh, four, 45 kilogram, kilograms. Uh, the recommended dose, it is 600 milligrams. But if the participant or patients are heavier, the uh, maximum dose that is that it can be given it is 800 milligrams according to WHO. So we took these two dose uh, uh, regimens and to evaluate the probability of target attainment, and we can see here different uh, lines and, and co or curves, and the indicators are here. So th uh, that line, uh, this one with circles, it is the flat dose of 400 milligrams by WHO. The curve with triangles, it is the high dose regimen. We use in this case the upper limit for the range, meaning 600 milligrams for uh, participants um, simulated that were uh, up to uh, 45 kilograms and 800 milligrams for uh, the rest of the simulated individuals. And we are proposing a regimen that we can find here with a uh, curve with boxes. And we, we can see here in this, uh, Great dotted horizontal line at the 90% of target attainment, meaning that from the simulated individuals, uh, those achieving at least a value of uh, 53 for the PKPD um, index that I mentioned before. And we can see that only those participants with uh, the higher dose regimen um, can achieve a P uh, probability of target attainment higher than 90% for the critical concentration. Uh, that for moxifloxacin, that is uh, 0 0.25 of the MIC. That actually it is the most frequent uh, MIC that we that we found in our population. So if the dose uh, given uh, or we use a dose proposed by WHO, the PTA or the target attainment, it is it is lower. And if we add the fibrins that we can see it in the in the blue curves, even it is even lower. So that is why we propose a new regimen. Uh, that, is, that is this uh, represented with boxes, and I will describe in this next slide. Uh, we can see it in the right panel here. So we propose that a uh, uh, regimen based on 800 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams of moxifloxacin, and for the first two weight bands uh, up to 45 kilograms, it should be given a dose of 800 milligrams in order to achieve uh, better exposure. And we can see here the level that is uh, for total AUC, there is. Um, well accepted that uh, 26.5 milligrams per hour per liter. It is necessary to achieve a PKPD of uh, 53, 53, sorry, considering a uh, uh, unbound fraction of 50% for moxifloxacin. And for heavier patients, uh, meaning for 46 kilograms or uh, 70 or to see 70 kilograms, 
the regimen should be uh, um, a thousand milligrams of moxifloxacin in order to, to get a better uh, exposure. And this is still being important, uh, at least in South African settings, for different reasons. Uh, the first one that I want to mention is that moxifloxacin is still being uh, used for both uh, short and long uh, regimens for rifampicin resist resistant and multidrug resistant tuberculosis. But last year was also suggested to include moxifloxacin as part of the treatment for drug susceptible tuberculosis. And I know that there are guidelines in different countries where uh, the people living with uh, tuberculosis and HIV, they are moving to, uh, they are switching fibrins to uh, dolotegravir. But in South Africa, the guidelines is still recommending to use uh, efavirenz instead of DTG, since efavirenz has uh, no interaction um, with rifampicin. So uh, that is everything for me, but I would like to say, uh, I got permission from uh, the organizers to advertise that we are hiding in our group. And I would like to acknowledge all of them because they were supporting uh, the, the full uh, authors to make this possible. And so we are hiding, uh, I wanted to say that. And if you are interested uh, to apply for any of uh, either PhD or postdoc positions, just please uh, feel free to reach out using this email. And this is my personal email in case that you want to ask me something about the presentation or, or something about the group, please, please uh, feel free to, to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Juan Eduardo. And do we have any questions from the public here? Also for anyone online who might want to ask a question. Um, I'll ask a quick question first. Um, it's Susie here. Um, Juan Eduardo. Um, just wondering, uh, the higher doses that you've looked at with moxifloxacin when you're also receiving, um, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly. It, um, what, if I'm in? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, have you looked at toxicity? Is that likely to be a problem? And also, the uh, question I had was whether or not you looked at um, uh, the FTA, the fractional target attainment across the um, the range of MICs, did that make any, um, did that make the doses any lower or? So uh, yeah, about toxicity uh, in this part, in this um, publication, we didn't include uh, the risk of uh, go higher than the, um, to achieve higher concentrations that uh, for the limit that is considered the threshold for toxicity that is around uh, three milligrams per liter for the CMAX. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, amoxifloxacin has been related to the QT prolongation. So it is a risk, uh, but uh, if the overall exposure is lower during the co-administration with the fibrins, it shouldn't be an issue. But uh, no, I mean, we did see, uh, see these values during after the simulations that we were performing, but we didn't put it out there in the, in the manuscript because we didn't have enough data. And we were also expecting to have some um, uh, PV information to be able to relate uh, toxic uh, concentrations, but that is a spoiler that I will not say anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and about the other uh, relation with the MICs, no, we didn't look about that. Uh, it has there are like several publications saying that maybe the um, the PKPD it, it might be different according to the uh, MIC level. I think that that was a question, right? Uh, but no, we didn't, we didn't analyze that part. Hi, uh, it's Martha. I have Hi, Martha. a question, and this is regarding meningeal tuberculosis. We sometimes use higher doses of moxifloxacin, like 400 milligrams every 12 hours in these patients to ensure the arrival of the great concentration to the central nervous system. Um, in these patients with the fibrins, that main, most of the times we don't have a direct uh, isolation of the mycobacteria and the like and we use other, other diagnostic tests. Would you go higher than uh, 1,000 milligrams per day or not? I, I know it's a difficult question, but I, I would come yeah. into this field if I had to treat this patient. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. And I guess that it depends on a lot of things. Um, first of all, it has been shown that 
the MIC distribution for um, moxifloxacin, it is quite different between countries. Um, in this case, in, in this population from South Africa, we saw this MIC 0 0.25 milligrams per liter as the most prevalent. But I know that there are like different distributions along uh, countries. So that will be something to consider. And the other thing is that I guess, and I don't want to say that I will give a higher dose because I, I shouldn't, uh, but uh, I don't know, in the end, I'm not a clinician and, uh, and maybe a clinician can have a better answer for this, but I guess that they need to be like very careful with the uh, toxicity that for moxifloxacin. I mean, if they are monitoring the QT, I mean, with by electrocardiograms, and I guess that it depends on a lot of things. And unfortunately, there are not too uh, many models uh, with CSF concentrations for moxifloxacin. And, um, uh, yeah, actually, uh, we are working in in developed models uh, with CSF concentrations. There is one published from this same group uh, about linezolid, and because, of course, it, 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 the ideal data for us it will be to have CSF concentrations in order to evaluate how much uh, high we can go uh, for a dose uh, to see how how much it is penetrating the CSF. Um, uh, so as I say, we are publishing for linezolid and paracinamide as well, isoniazid and RIF. But for MOXI, there are not too many data in how good is the penetration of moxifloxacin through the blood-brain barrier. And and sorry, I'm just avoiding to say if I will give a higher dose. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that a clinician will be uh, better to answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, that was a great presentation, and I think it's a beautiful example of how uh, of the application of pharmacometric modeling in the clinical setting, uh, especially in such a special population. Yes, thank you, Patty. <laughs>